Hi, I'm Sam, and this is a winged bean. So funny story, that's not a winged bean. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to leave the footage as is and just have overlay of actual winged beans, but yeah, this is a yalibu apparently. Yeah. Another local bean. Yalibu bean. It looks similar enough that it'll work for this part though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Papua New Guinea right now. Unfortunately, not during the winged bean season, but I figured this is a plant I just have to cover because while it's only grown small scale right now, there's a chance in the next few decades we could see this become a pretty major world crop. This is one of those plants that's probably native to New Guinea and also first domesticated here, but it's beginning to show up more and more worldwide to the point that I can even find it sold in Canada sometimes. So as you can probably guess from this being called a bean, this is a legume, and a climbing one at that can get over four meters long, though you can see that length can be hard to judge because it tangles around itself so much. But today it's growing in a lot of New Guinea, South and Southeast Asia as well. And this is a great plant for a lot of reasons. It's very versatile, great eating, very disease resistant, and it's a great nitrogen fixer. And by that, I mean, like a lot of other legumes, on the roots of the plant, you'll see these little knobs sticking out. And those are little things that form relationships with certain bacteria that take nitrogen from the air and put it into a form that plants can use. And bear in mind that nitrogen is a nutrient that all plants need to grow. It's the basis for nitrogen fertilizers, both natural and synthetic. And this plant has more of those nodes than any other known legume currently. So how about the beans? Their appearance can vary quite a bit, but usually they've got a neat shape, something like this, which is where many of the plant's names come from winged bean, four-angled bean, dragon bean. When it's green like this, you can just eat it fresh, fried, smoked, in soups. It's great for stir-fries because it's got a really good crunch that doesn't disappear with light cooking. If you wait until the pods are mature and grayish-brown, they'll split open and the seeds will come out. At this point, they're a lot like soybeans, very high in protein and high in tocopherols, which help the body to use up vitamin A. At this stage, though, they do need to be cooked for a few hours, not only to soften them, but because they do have some chemicals in them that can interfere with proper digestion. So those just need to be cooked out. Another thing you can do with these is to grind them up into what's basically a high protein flour. It's also found recent use as an alternative animal feed because it's a very quick, easy to grow, cheap source of protein. But the plant is even more versatile than that because actually the whole plant is edible and all of it is quite high in protein. These leaves can be used a lot like spinach, and have amongst the highest known levels of vitamin A of any tropical plants, actually. And that's important because researchers have realized that these beans, there's a lot of places around the world with a good climate that these could grow in. And in a, a number of those areas, including large parts of Africa, vitamin A deficiency is a huge problem, and leads to a lot of cases of blindness every year, actually. So this could be a way to help with that. Even the flowers here are actually edible, and while well, there's not much to them, and it's hard to actually get much out of them because you don't eat very much, uh, they are also high in protein. Both the leaves and the flowers are about 10 to 15 percent protein. The roots, or the tubers here, are also edible. They often stick out of the ground like this, and they can be used to just, you know, take one, plant it somewhere else, and then you've got a new plant. You can eat them raw or cooked, and they're also about 20 percent protein, which is higher than most root vegetables. And this is another reason why these could be great in some of those places where currently people have diets with staples being like cassava or plantain, which are quite low in protein. This root is actually where it gets its local name, husbin. Now for a while I misunderstood and thought they were saying husband plant, and ask as I might, I couldn't figure out why, but then it just turned out it was husbin, which is top pigeon for bottom bean, because it's a bean where Unlike most beans, you can also get something from the bottom. So anyway, this is a great plant, and the yields are pretty top-notch. I mean, the, just the dried beans alone, you can get about two tons per hectare, which is similar to what you would get from modern soybeans. And the tubers, those you can get about, at least as the people in the highlands here would cultivate them, you can get about 11 tons per hectare. And the full green pods, those you can get about 35 tons per hectare. 
which is a fair bit more than you would get from any sort of green beans. And in addition to producing well, they store well as well, because they're immune to a number of pests, including brooched beetles, which are one of the biggest pests of stored legumes worldwide. And so some are saying this could be the next tropical soybean. The nutritional profiles are pretty equivalent and even better in some ways. And the conditions they grow in match with a lot of Central and South America, the Caribbean, Africa, Western Asia, Oceania. And in a lot of those places, good protein sources can be quite limited. And great for growing in poor soils too, because of how well it takes nitrogen and puts it into the soil. So with all this, with people saying this could replace soybeans in the tropics, and people have been saying this for a while now, why hasn't it happened yet? Why does it just stay as this small-scale crop when it could be so beneficial as a large-scale commercial crop? Well, the answer to that is, at this time, unfortunately, it's just not practical. And these types of plants interest me a lot. The type that, they work great as a crop if you're just wild harvesting them or growing them on a small scale just in your garden, but when you try and work in them into our modern methods of cultivation, our economies of scale, they're just not practical anymore. Maybe having an awkwardly long development cycle, maybe having just a shape that's too awkward for any sort of mechanical harvesters. In this case, there's a couple of reasons. First, at least compared to soybeans, they won't grow in the same wide range of climates. That is, they will grow in northern climates, but they won't produce fruit because they're very dependent on the days not getting too long. And in northern climates, you have very long days in the summer. So you'll have a big dense mat of leaves, but little to no fruit. But that's just far from the equator. What about in the tropics? Why don't they do it there? Well, then there's the anti-nutritive chemicals, those chemicals that interfere with proper digestion. But that's not actually uncommon with beans, and they actually have less of that than soybeans ordinarily do. But it is still there, and that does limit how you can use them, and creates a bit of extra risk if people don't know how to process them properly. But the biggest thing that keeps winged beans from commercial production, they're expensive to grow. Out of all the known varieties, and there's over 800, all of them are climbers. And that means you have to give them something to climb on. And in large-scale agriculture, that would probably mean stakes. And if you don't give them stakes, they'll just form a dense, tangled mat on the ground and produce very few pods. They've had some success growing winged beans in coconut, banana, rubber, and cacao plantations, but that's still difficult to harvest by machine. And staking's fine for a garden, but spread that out over a big field, and that starts to get very expensive and very labor-intensive very fast. And for a lot of people, it's just n simply not worth the cost. This is something that researchers are investigating. As I said, there's over 800 different varieties of this, and the genetics are a little bit different in each of them. So the hope is that we'll find some varieties that have a stiff stem that can grow more upright on its own, and that will be a lot easier to harvest mechanically. And researchers are also trying to find if some of these breeds have lower levels of the anti-nutritive chemicals, so that they can perhaps create breeds that have little to none of that in there. But so far, nothing's come out. And of course, if a new breed is developed, we do want to be careful not to just start planting huge numbers of only this single breed all at once with no genetic variation in there. Then you start running the risk of having disease or pests wipe out huge areas of this crop all at once. We've seen that before with corn, with potatoes, with bananas. It's an expensive scenario. But we're not there yet. While it's helpful for these researchers to keep that in mind, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And hopefully if this works out, we'll be able to keep some diversity in the bean field. But at this point, we can only speculate. So, if anything I've said has raised any questions, if you have any corrections, suggestions, or passing remarks, feel free to comment that down below. And if you learned something in this video and would like to see more, liking and subscribing always really helps me out. This video is made on behalf of the Garoka Natural Habitat, a place looking to preserve a slice of Papua New Guinean highland forest for education, research, enjoyment, and to teach people to cultivate honey at the same time. A huge thank you to Kelly e and I for letting me stay here and supporting this project. If you're looking for a great place to volunteer as a researcher, carpenter, teacher, beekeeper, fish pond specialist, mushroom grower, or any of other numerous other specialties, this is a great place to do it. So for more practical and otherwise interesting tropical plants of Papua New Guinea, join me next time on Ambling with Sam.